Hello again, everyone, and welcome to The Frontline with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, joined as always by Joe Resinello. Once more, dear friends, we're going into the breach. So uh, we just want to give everybody a heads up. We did a phenomenal, phenomenal interview this afternoon with Jesse Romero. For those of you who are not familiar, Jesse's a, he's been a Catholic speaker, teacher, preacher for the last 20, 30 years. Guy's a real deal, ex-law enforcement. He's got a brand new book out called The Devil in the, what is it? The Devil, the Devil in the, in the City, City of Angels, Angels okay? So we had about an hour, a little over an hour interview where it's uh, being edited right now. We're going to be posting that uh, both on YouTube um, and on our Facebook page. So all you wonderful people are going to be able to see it. Uh, and we were very excited about doing that. So ordinarily, okay, we have a bunch of, uh, what would you call it? We would call it our hit list, not in the mafioso way, of course. Uh, but we usually have our hit list, uh, things that we're going to be covering, let's say, on, 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 our, on, our, on our Sunday night show. But we decided to, to put that aside for this week because uh, we wanted to talk a little bit more. And we really, really are encouraging people to comment in and question. And this is going to be a more general conversation. But before we get into that, just so everybody knows, our weekly show that we normally do on Sunday night, we are going to be doing this Tuesday on the Crusade Channel. We're going to be filling in for Rick Barrett. Uh, on the Crusade Channel, brought the Crusade Channel is brought to you by Mike Church, and many of you knew, many of you know who he is. So we're we're grateful and honored that they made it a, a slot for us. We now fill in from time to time, and we're we're working on getting a um, more of a steady a steady gig with them down there. But it's uh, we're going to cover all the nonsense that's going on. There's and there's a lot of nonsense going on. Point being, we need to start talking about what are the more general general questions, the general problems that we have in this country that we face, not just as Catholics, but all people of goodwill. Okay, and people of goodwill, I guess you would agree with me, Joe, is going to be defined as people who understand the moral law, that understand boundaries, that respect families, okay, and marriage. They follow respect, the golden rule. Follow the golden rule. They respect life. We've gotten away from that. Right now, if you look at it, every major civilization, I don't care who it is, even as powerful as Rome, what was Rome's biggest downfall? Rome departed from first principles, their own first principles, laid down 500 BC at the founding of the Republic. That's why ultimately Rome fell. And America's going down the same path. Why? And now I'm going to hand this over to Resinello because we lack order. We lack the proper order in this country that most people in this country recognize for a very long time, I think up until very recently, okay, where it was God, family, country. That was the order. And it was acceptable to many people because most people here are religious. And Joe and I will be the first one. We don't agree with all religions. We don't, all right? But we there respect, was a respect of, we respect people. We respect people. All right, and the people that people that understand there's a moral order, there's a natural order, there are natural boundaries. That's the conversation we have to have tonight at the front line with Joe and Joe. That's the breach that we're going into. Until we get it right as a nation, under God, first, under God, primarily, we're finished. And with that, I'm handing it off to my boy. As Joe said, I think we have to, get, again, get back to first principles as a nation. I mean, that is basically our platform. And that's basically one of the objective, I guess, like themes that this show was founded upon. As Joe said, it should be God, family, country. But I'm going to actually take it another step. It should be God, family, self. You see, sadly, we live in an age, I call it the selfie age. It's the age of the selfie. It's all about me. At the end of the day, anything that is good requires sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Everything that is good requires a lack of putting yourself second. Whether it's going to college, you have to, you, there's probably many things you want to do with that money, with that time. You sacrifice four years for what? To get an education? For what? To get a job. You sacrifice for your family. For what? So your kids can get educated. So your kids can have a good life. You take a back seat. This is what's lost. This is at the root of the problem. Mm. What's at the root of it all is we push God out of our society. Now, many people say, well, why do I need God? 
You need a rudder in life. You see, people who do not have a guiding value system, frankly, my friend, there's nothing that life becomes Darwinistic. Life becomes very Machiavellian. Mm -hmm. I can do it, so therefore I will. I am strong. You are not. Mm -hmm. I will take advantage of the situation. Mm -hmm. See, God roots you in a value structure. These people, like I could use an example, take Mormons. I absolutely do not agree with them from a theological perspective. However, I absolutely respect them as a people. Why? Because they have a guiding principle. They're family-based. They have a guiding principle. And for the most part, obviously, if you want to like go through their, 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 their society with a fine-tooth comb, you're going to find issues, as you will in any, in any group. Seat. But as a whole, and I've been out to Utah for work. I've worked there two times. I probably spent a month, give or take. They're good people. I respect them. I have utter respect for Orthodox Jews. I was just going to say we've spoken utter about this before. These are people that these are people that they don't play games. Your 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 Orthodox Jew does not play games on issues of life. Okay, they are not pro death. They are not again. They 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 are not in favor of anything, any other arrangement for a family outside of one man, one woman, and they have lots of kids. They do, as Joe mentioned, like one of his friends he works with has eleven kids. Here's my view. God bless him. You know, we, we're both Italian-American. We lived in a time when families had very, or, or mothers and fathers had very large families. My father was one of eight siblings, okay? My mother was one of six. So, the, so the, the, the point is, we've departed so far, and that's really kind of what we want to talk about tonight. We've departed so far from these basic fundamentals that we all know, by the way. The church simply reminds us, but in our heart, okay, because of the natural law and because, because God reveals himself to everybody through the natural law, all right, and what we know, that we know these things to be right. We allow the forces in this country that are anti these things. They're anti-order. They're anti-Christ. They're anti-truth. Jesse said that in the, in the interview we had with him today. In other words, they're propagandists. They're liars. They're not interested in debate. They're not interested in conversation. They want to shut you down every time they, they, that you disagree with them. This is what we need to fight against. And yes, all people of goodwill in, goodwill in this particular battle. We can have our conversations about our theological differences. We can have our debates, and we ought to. But we all need to come together to confront the forces of evil in this country. And let's be clear. Let's be very clear. The forces are evil. That's what they are. When you champion, number one, like Joe said, leaving aside the individual issues, when you champion telling, kicking God out of your society, like the, the um, what is it, the, all the atheist groups, the freedom from religious organization, for freedom from religion, and the rest of them, at what point do we tell them, who are you? Who are you to tell us how to live our lives? Who are you to tell us what you're going to teach our children? If I want to teach my child that three days after he was crucified and died, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then I'm going to teach my child that, and you will mind your own business. But we don't have that right now. We don't, they are right now at this moment in time. I hate to break it to you. They're winning. They're winning. Our children are at risk. Oh, I, I would agree, and that's another reason why we do this show. U ultimately, from a theological perspective, only God opens up hearts. What I would also say with regard to what Joe is saying is you know them by the fruit that they bear. Look at people, and I was – you know, fortunate enough in my life, I went to school, uh, I went to a Jesuit college, and I, I met many families. I went to school, a lot of large families. Many of them were very, uh, to be honest with you, well-to-do. The fruit that their families bore, kids who became doctors, lawyers, engineers, good people, married 40, 50 years. Look at the fruit that that bears versus the fruit that this culture is embracing right now. Look at California. California right. is a bastion of, of decadence. Oh, the practical application of all the bad ideas that we rail against, you're seeing in California. New York's not far behind. It'll be there soon. All right, it'll be there soon, okay? So and, and another thing, too, it's got nothing to do with money. New York has Wall Street. New York is awash in money. California has Silicon Valley and Hollywood. They are awash in cash. It's got nothing, it has nothing to do with money. 
These are wealthy states, but their ideas stink. Not only do, are the, do, do their ideas think, they're, in, in some cases, as, as Andrew Cuomo just recently proved, they're outright evil, okay? Outright evil. Pushing the abortion law in New York to the point where not only can an abortion be, be conducted or had or whatever you want to call it, performed, um, committed the day before the baby's born, you could, you, like a non-doctor could do it. Like any, it's almost like, like we said before, you know, abortion can be, should, is as easy as going down and ordering a, a, a cheeseburger at Wendy's. That's the way it is in New York. It's, it's the practical, like Joe said, it's, it's, it's the, you see the bad fruit of all their ideas. And what we really, one of the things we have to do, stop letting them blame us. Gavin Newsom says we don't have enough money from the federal government. No, you're not getting any more. If I was Donald Trump, I don't know if he has already. You're not getting any more money. You have enough money. Your problems are that you don't want to face reality. You want to live in this. What, do, what would you call it? California? They're living in a fantasy world out there. In the meantime, people are defecating in the street, hypodermic needles on the ground. You got people. There was a shot online of the of the of the gay pride day. There's a. This is a little graphic. I'm sorry. Okay, put the kids in the uh, uh, take the kids away from the screen for a minute. There, there's a homeless guy laying on the sidewalk, and right next to him in the picture is one man sodomizing another on the street in broad daylight. And the only conclusion you could come to is this place is devoid of order. That's the order we're talking about tonight that we need to recapture in this country and in many places in America. I think you would agree. It's still there. Because there's, I think there's more people of goodwill than, than not in, in America. I don't see America as, as a place like where every, everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid. I think the problem is a lot of people don't have a voice. I think a lot of people really just don't have a voice. Well, I think a lot of people, to be honest with you, lack courage and they just get up, go, you know, they follow the, you know, the leader, so to speak, because they just want to go along and kind of not make waves. But sadly, freedom has to be fought for every day. Um, and without that anchor, which is God, frankly, man fails. We are all subject to what's called concupiscence, which is something whereby we have an inclination to sin. Sin still exists. God gives us grace to overcome ourselves. You see, this is something that, again, it's, it's, it's the variable that's not discussed. It's the anchor. Why do you think New Year's resolutions never are fulfilled? They're great ideas. But they're rooted in nothing. They're rooted in nothing. Yeah. You see, grace is the something mm -hmm. that helps you perpetuate the idea. And this is how societies thrive. This is how America at one time thrived. And now it's faltering. It's the denominator whereby all our problems stem from. Right. The numerator, which we're going to discuss a little bit more, are some of the, I guess, like the bad fruits that stem from this godless society. The first being the breakdown of the family. Everyone comes from a family. Whether you are a brain surgeon, like our friend Artie from <laughs> Belleville, he has a son who is a brain surgeon. Yep. He's a brain surgeon from Belleville, New Jersey. God bless, bless him. him. Yeah. Normal guy, regular guy, has a son, went to med school, he's a brain surgeon. Or whether you're just a simple laborer at a construction site, you come from a family. People who come from loving homes, stable homes, peaceful homes, nine times out of ten. Again, it's not a perfect equation. You will produce solid citizens. Mm -hmm. I have seen this. I, I grew up with people. Not everyone went to fancy colleges. I know guys that didn't go to college. They came from loving homes that put God first. Two parents, a man and a woman who loved each other, who were devoted to raising their children, who weren't caught up in consumerism, who weren't caught up in all of the material nonsense and secular dreams that our society has embraced, and they have produced wonderful citizens. Yep. This is, if you do that, my friends, 50% of our issues disappear. Like, like nothing, they disappear. They disappear. But I want to just, just chime in for a second, but there's one, there's one underlying theme to what, to, to reason, I should say, for why these people lived good lives. Because 
they had the ability and the willingness to say no to themselves and to say no to their families once in a while. And what I mean by no is you can't have everything. In other words, sometimes you do have to be content. In other words, to know that you're living a good life and stop listening to the lies that Hollywood sells. Stop listening to the lies that the advertising industry sells. Stop listening to the lies that the usurers sell because they want you to drive you into debt. So you go out and buy things you don't need with money that you don't have and that you're never going to pay back. And then put those chains on you and see how you fly. Again, they convince you that just living your life the way Joe just described, I'm worried about, let's say from a man's point of view, I'm worried about my wife. I'm worried about my children. I'm worried about my relationship with God primarily. Um, and I want to do the right thing so we can live a good life in this world. And yes, dare I say, because there is a next life. I want to live the best life in next. Okay. It's, it's not simplistic, but it's simple. Because a little simplicity is what we need in this country. We're constantly being barraged. This is one of the things I think speaks to what we're talking about tonight. We put all sorts of things in front of God. How many things in this country do we Like you mentioned, material things. That's why the church teaches that consumerism is really, really bad. Actually condemns consumerism. Because we start to put the things we could buy in front of our worship of God and our service of God. Things that we can have because somebody's convinced us we need to have it, okay? In other words, whether it be the best TV or the, the car you can't afford, all these things that are meant to drive you into debt, it's all a matter of we just keep putting, we put, keep putting things in front of and, and placing obstacles in front of ourselves to get to what our destiny is, which is to live a good life in this world, raise our kids, like you said, okay? Uh, create good people, not just create people, but form them into good, God-fearing people, and then go to heaven. That was Western civilization, by the way, up until the Enlightenment, when everything just got <laughs> when everything just got turned on its head. But one of the things that keep families together is God. There's a reason why in the Catholic faith there's seven sacraments. Marriage is one of them. I. I, me and my wife help teach uh, the pre cana course, and we usually give a talk in the Archdiocese of Newark to people who are getting married. And I've seen all types of people, people who are professionals, people who are blue collar, all of which are getting married. People are convinced that they can almost will themselves to a good marriage. I got news for you. I have three children. Me and my wife both work. We feel all the stresses of this world. Marriage is a hard thing. Why? Because we are limited and the world is constantly attacking you. God helps put everything in place. And I'm going to tell you an example of that. Our Pope, Pope Francis, our Pope, meaning our Catholic Pope, not everyone here is listening, is Catholic, said this. Outside of the grace that you get in your marriage from living a sacramental life, marriage, if you have God in your marriage, it helps you to do three things. One, say thank you to your spouse. Two, may I. And three, the most important of them all, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If we don't have that, when you take God out of the equation, marriage turns into a war. Yeah. It turns into a war. It turns into a needless struggle because marriage should not be a struggle. No, the way it's portrayed in the media and the way it's portrayed in Hollywood, what's the statistic we, we, we shared a couple of months ago, okay? The, uh, someone, we were responding to someone who was saying that, well, Catholics have a higher divorce rate or as, or as high a divorce rate as anybody else in America. You're right. But as a percentage of, uh, of divorces of faithful Catholics, faithful meaning ABCs, goes to church on Sunday, prays every day, goes to confession frequently. And, and yeah, doesn't cheat on your spouse, okay? In other words, but primarily goes to mass, prays, and goes to confession. 4%. I'll throw, 4%. Another, I'll throw another statistic, which I heard recently along those lines. If you pray together, you and your wife pray together. Like if I was counseling you as, as, as a married couple, my first thing I would ask you, do you pray together? 1%. 1% of families that pray together, not just going to church, say you pray the rosary together, which me and my wife do, it takes 15 minutes, it takes 15 minutes mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. You pray together 
1% of those marriages divorce. Now, that doesn't mean that those two people are perfect. Far from it. There is grace. You see, marriage is hard. I will, that's why half of the people fail. You don't magically have a good family. Mm -hmm. Just like anything in life, people magically are not successful. If it was that easy, everyone would be. So you have to work. You have to work at it. Right. And that is one of the biggest mistakes. When I look at people, when I teach that class, and I can tell if you're not into it, I, I wasn't born yesterday. You are behind the eight ball before you begin. Right. You are behind the eight ball because you're you and I'm me and we are sinners and we're broken people, all of us, mm -hmm. and we need God. If you're not humble enough to recognize that, you, my friend, are in trouble, not just in your marriage, but in everything, right? Everything. And that's why it's vital. It's vital. And the family is what is the building block of society. I grew up, I have the same, I'm, I'm, you know, not everyone has this. I grew up in the same area where I live now. I only live like four miles north of the town I grew up in. I have the same friends for many years. And I've watched them since we were children to now. Many of them were victims of divorce. And I've known them before the divorce. I've known them after the divorce. It has effect, it has lasting effects on people. Mm -hmm. It wounds you. There is a wound. It's not natural for a child to go through this. It's a wound. You could recover from it. I'm not saying it's a mortal wound, but it's a wound. It's a wound nonetheless. And I've seen it, how it's manifested itself in my friends' lives. You see, this is a fundamental building block of society. Mm -hmm. And everything that we do as a society to, should contribute to strengthening that bond. Right. Because no matter who you are, whether you're picking up the trash or you're operating on someone's heart, you come from a family and decency and kindness and sacrificial mentality in life all come from the family. Why is it that, why is it such a shock to people when, when, you, when you mention that when you talk about the word sacrifice, I can't think of I can't think of one person, just from my own personal experience in my life, I can't think of one person who was successful in anything, in anything, whether it was business, whether it was their profession, in anything without sacrifice. I could point to every single one of them who were successful and say, oh, well, they obviously sacrificed a lot there because a lot of people wouldn't have done that, but then they turn around and they were successful. Let's say it was a business venture. Do you understand the person suffered you know, worked hard, right? And it's one thing I was trying to tie this into getting back to what we were saying earlier about you, 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 you had just written down there. I just happened to glance at it. Selfishness. We have, we're in a, we're in a selfish society that everybody's so fearful. Forget about saying no to other people. They're so fearful of saying no to themselves. I'm guilty of it in my life. I'm not, I'm not judging anybody, but let's say we, we are so fearful of saying, no, I can't do that because it's always that I, 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 you know, but also I gotta people, have it, I gotta have it. And that leads us into the second point. I gotta have it. Years ago, like when I was a kid, I'm 49 years old, you know. You're a kid. <laughs> uh, but in terms of like, you know, my parents, this is before like credit was like accessible to everybody. My father was a barber. You know, my father couldn't qualify for an American Express card. I can remember my, I think he's still, it's in his craw. Like, you know, now credit... We don't have the self-discipline to handle credit as a society. And I want to get to the root of why. You see, we don't know who we are. You see, when you know who you are, you don't have to impress others. You see, I know who I am. I know where I'm from. I'm not, and I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm a child of God. I don't have to impress anyone. You see, credit, the way it's structured now, allows you to obtain things that you can't afford, and it enslaves you. Yeah. And this is another, if I was going to pick, after the breakdown of the family, the second destructive force in our society 
It is that people, I, but it's at the root of it. It I'm ties in. It. it ties into it. The, the the attack on the family and the destruction of the family. One of the means by which that's accomplished is through credit usury. Let's call it what it is. Tired of people afraid to use certain words. Okay. There's a lot of people involved in usury, okay, before anybody starts brain start exploding over at the ADL, okay? Usury is a sin. Let's be clear. It's not an acceptable practice. 18% right. on a credit card is usury. Usury, okay? And when you convince someone who, who says, I don't need your credit, yeah, but don't you want to have that? Don't you want to have that? It's a constant barrage. It's a very, by the way, I'm not going to deny it is, is psychologically, it's a powerful thing. The way the advertising industry works, okay? The way they try to convince us, well, if you're not out there buying, the economy is going to come to a screech, screeching halt. So you got to go out and spend five, ten thousand $10,000 on things you don't need because we got to keep the economy moving because we have to grow. You know, it's like a mantra. It's like a false god. Economic growth. Well, what happens if economic growth was 1%? But I know that everybody in America is raising their family. They have good wages. Corporate profits are good. Maybe not growing as fast as you want. What's wrong with stability? See, stability, I think, is more important than growth. We have growth right now. Market, last time I checked, last week in another high. Okay? But that doesn't mean that we live in a, we live in a country that has a stable economy or a completely stable economy because we are riddled with debt. National debt. Personal debt. And that's part of the attack on the family. Let me tell you something. If you're a working man and you're going out and earning the paycheck, and let's say you're a good, God-fearing Roman Catholic man who's got five kids at home, okay, and you're going out and earning the paycheck because mama's home taking care of the kids, okay, the one thing you don't want is debt. The one thing you don't want is to put those chains on you. Because all that labor that you're, using, that you're going out and you're, you're, you're selling in the market, that you're getting paid for, it's getting stolen by the user, leaving aside that it's getting stolen by the government too. All right, Eddie just joined in, so Eddie knows exactly what I'm talking about. He's going to be running for Congress down in Florida. That's another form. So let's be clear. My point in saying all that is part of the attack on the family, which makes it more difficult, not, you know, again, we, we have to overcome a lot of things, uh, but makes it more difficult to raise your family in a proper way is... This could be a whole other conversation, but is the theft of your labor. And that usury that you're talking about, the debt, is a theft of your labor. Like I said, when you're trying to have a stable life, when you, like you said, a sacrificial life. Um, I remember, I, look, I'm the first one to say, I say it all the time. My old man, he died in 2005, okay? God rest his soul. I pray for him every day, okay? My father had a lot of problems. But one thing is when it came to it, when it came to sending my brother to school, me to school, and my sister to school, and I used to say, hey, dad, why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? He goes, for the same reason that I can't have a Cadillac, because you're going to school. That was what he valued, okay? That was his value. He wanted to send us to get a good education, and he did. My brother, my sister, and me. But it required sacrifice, or else guess what? My father couldn't afford Seton Hall Prep if he was paying off a Cadillac note. My father couldn't afford it, Seton Hall Prep, if his house, instead of it being buying a house in 1972 for $19,000, shocker, in Newark, New Jersey, okay, instead decided he wanted to buy a house that he really couldn't afford for $40,000 at the time, then guess what? I don't go to Seton Hall Prep. And credit and I, has allowed that to happen because it extends the leash. Years ago, it was a lot harder to get a credit card. It was a lot harder. People bought things on layaway. Credit <laughs> now, businesses know. It's a psychological game. Right. And we buy into it and we become slaves. And sadly, our society doesn't have the self-discipline. And the government allows it to happen because it fuels the economy. Yes, it does. So this is the dilemma. The answer is simple. Live on what you earn. If you need to go buy something on credit, do so. Do it sparingly. I'm going to give you an exercise. When you do your taxes, I want you to uh, calculate all the compounded interest that you spent your hard-earned money on in the calendar year. That's credit cards, that's your mortgage, that's your car payment. And I want you to add it all up, put that number on your refrigerator and stare at it for, that's student loans, mm. stare at it all year. And see if, you're, see if you could keep your stomach from turning when you see how your labor is being stolen when you look at that you number. See, 
credit, they love you in debt. They want you to be in debt and they laugh. I work in a bank. The CEOs, they laugh. They know you're, you become a slave and the majority of Americans are just that. They have that number and they're spending in some cases five digits a year. Right. It could be $17,000. Could you use $17,000? I bet you could. Right. So this is my point. Another example is this. Again, going back to the de denominator of God. Do you know who you are? Who were you trying to impress? Because ultimately, no one cares. Nor do those people you're trying to impress How care about that? you. How true is that? They don't care right. about you. You drive up in a Cadillac, the only thing that they care is they say, oh, I'm going to get someone to go and buy a BMW. And this is what people that because they don't know who they are. I can remember my aunt, God rest her soul, grew up in the same neighborhood as Joe Basile and my father did. They went to high school together, ironically enough. And I remember my aunt, she had a house. Uh, they were very fortunate, her and her husband. They did pretty well for themselves. They had a house down the shore. And uh, the American dream is if you have arrived, you have two homes. Yeah. Anyway, Especially if one of them is on the Jersey Shore. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my, mind you, my, my uncle Richard built, he framed it with his own hands by the way. <laughs> Hold that thought one sec. Let's give a quick shout out. we got a bunch of people joining. We're really encouraging everybody to join the conversation. Uh, this is a more, uh, let's call it a heartfelt conversation tonight here at the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo and Joe Resinello, eight o'clock Sunday nights, Facebook live. We're talking in more general terms about the loss of God, the loss of family and the, and, and, and the, fa and the fact that it's causing our country that we love very dearly. Okay. It's causing it to crumble. So we want to give a couple shout outs. Eddie's with us. Sean, Vinny, my baby's out there. Nancy's there. Michael joined in. Um, we got a few people online right now. So yeah. So right now we are uh, we're talking about these things. But Joe mentioned Joe mentioned slavery. Go ahead. Well, you were telling the story about yeah, your my uncle aunt, Richard. We were down the shore, and I remember we saw this big house. And my aunt Lydia, she said, "Oh my gosh, look at that big house. They must have such a big family." And I just said to myself, "I didn't, you know, I'm like." They, that, they, they could occupy two of the rooms in that monstrous house. They're paying all this money in taxes just to say that you have a big house. Right. We've lost the identity of who we are. You see, the world defines you by what you have. God defines you who you are. Mm -hmm. And when you know that, you don't buy in. And when you don't buy in, your bank account grows. I'm telling you a secret. Right. That's I'm just the key. telling you Joe a just secret. gave you the key, to, the, the key to a more prosperous life. If we were simply talking about being prosperous, self-sacrifice, committed, loving relationship, kids, God up top, okay, informing all that, all right? And I, I guarantee you, this is not the prosperity gospel, so I don't want to hear anybody say it. But the bottom line is, when you live responsibly, according to Joe, I'm going to use the word that's a bad word nowadays, according to the rules, okay, you will prosper. Moreover, just from a, just a, as a aside for a second, and you will piss off the oligarchs whose 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 sole goal in life is to keep all of us in chains. Eddie, chiming in, all right. Uh, Eddie said the family is the last buffer against totalitarianism. And Eddie, I, I, I'm sure you've heard of Gramsci. We brought him up. We brought him up uh, a few times on the show in the last few months. Okay, Antonio Gramsci. And what you're alluding to there is what Gramsci described and what he actually promoted, which was the long march through the institutions. The, central to his long march, the central institution that he needed to take down uh, was the Catholic Church. However, having said that, all societal institutions, so infiltrating the media, infiltrating academia, and destroying the family. You are absolutely right. I, I brought it up before on the show. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a great scene in a movie, um, and, and it speaks volumes about what we're talking about, what Eddie's talking about right now. When the Khmer Rouge have the main character in one of the re-education uh, camps, okay, and um, this is during the killing fields in Cambodia, and they bring the little kid up to uh, the two the two comrades, bring the little kid up, and there's a poster with the stick figure of obviously what is a mother and a father holding on the hand of a little child, all in stick figures. And they give the little child the crayon, 
and the child goes over and he puts a big X through the parents. Eddie, that scene defines what the totalitarians want. That's why, as Joe's describing, we as people who value family need to fight tooth and nail against all the people whose motivation it is, whose sole goal it is, is to destroy the family so that the, that the individual is left bufferless. You use the word buffer, Eddie. Bufferless between himself or herself and the power of the state. The family central to our fight in our culture war. Without strong families, we're toast. We're toast. And alluding to like the selfie generation, which is our third issue with our society presently, is the rampant selfishness. What drives someone to be selfless? By the way, the definition of love does not derive itself from a feeling. That's the frosting. Mm. Love gives. It doesn't take. Love is selfless. That's what love is. Why does someone sacrifice for another? Love. Ultimately, yes. But what is the goal? If your life is rooted in the here and now, you live purely a secular life. It's not a God-driven life. You want yours now. Right. You see, a person who believes in God, that's why it's the denominator. I look at my parents. Do you know my mother, both my parents, blue-collar people. My mother was a secretary. My father was a barber in a one-man barber shop. Both me and my brother have master's degrees. We lived in a middle-class town. Why? Because they did many of the things which I just talked about. I never saw my mother buy anything nice for herself, ever. My mother didn't buy fancy shoes. My mother didn't have a fancy pocketbook. My mother didn't have fancy clothes. Wasn't important. She spent all of her money on me and my brother to advance ourselves. That is a fact. But why? What's the underlying driving thing? Love? Yes. That's important. You believe in God. Your home isn't here. You see, my house is not in Southern Bergen County. It is, theoretically. But in 40 years, I won't be here. My home is in heaven. My life is driving towards that goal. My life here, all things are used to get to that goal. Right. My money, job, car, they're just utilities. Right. When you have that in mind, selflessness is easier to grasp. It's still hard. It's a struggle. Uh, for all people, because we're human, getting back to the word concupiscence once again. But selflessness, I, I don't, I'm on social media. I don't, for those of you who watch this and who know me, you could look at my Facebook page. I very rarely put anything personal on it outside of religious. I put the gospel on every single day. A lot of just about everything I do because I see a need for it in society. There's a thirst for it, whether you realize it or not, and I'm trying to fill that thirst. That's always been my deal. I, though, look at social media. I have all types of friends educated friends, non educated friends, religious friends, non religious friends, all types of friends, childhood friends, friends from college. Social media, if you look at the driving factors, why people do things, it's a pissing contest. Everyone's trying to show people how rich they are, how good their life is. Right. I'm not saying it's bad, good, or indifferent. But my point but it, is... But it's always that explanation. It's like when somebody says that you haven't, maybe haven't seen in a while, say, hey, how are you doing? And the first thing you want to talk about is how well you're doing financially. That's not what they asked. In other words, what they asked was, how are you doing? Not what your bank book looked like. Not did you buy a bigger house recently. Not what your new car looked like. Just how are you doing? Okay, on a more on a more personal, fundamental level, I want to just get back to what you were saying for a second. A th Saint Thomas Aquinas defined love as willing the good of the other as other. In other words, that's what the church teaches. Okay, that's what Christ did on the cross. He willed our good, expecting nothing in return. Okay, that's and that's one of the things that we've lost in this culture. Every time somebody does something good for somebody, they expect something in return. Nobody even wants to think about doing something. They talk, give a good a lot of lip service. Oh, I think we should do this for this person. We should, we should do something for the poor. Well, roll up your sleeves, all right? Roll up your sleeves and go and go actually go out and feed people, let's say, selflessly, as Joe's describing. 
The reason why I bring this up is I, why, why I brought up Aquinas is one of the problems in our culture, I think you would agree, is a, a, um, a deliberate uh, wrong definition of what love is. In other words, we're saturated in this culture with sex, let's face it, okay? You even have a Catholic priest out there that runs around who says that you're talking about how the way two men express their love for one another is sexual in nature when he's talking about, you know, sodomy, okay? Now, aside from what you think of that, but the point is, here's a Catholic priest who's, who's actually defining love as, as like the sexual act as, 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 an, as an act of, of, let's say, like that defines love. You, you know what I'm trying to say? It. Rather than, rather than let's, and, and, that's one, and that's one of the things, what, uh, in our culture, let's see, uh, oh, one of the famous lines from when we were kids, love is never having to say you're sorry. That was from Love Story. Allie, um, what was her name? Allie McGraw and, um, and Ryan O'Neill. Love is never having to say you're sorry. I think love is having to say you're I sorry. I say I'm sorry all the time. Say I'm sorry. <laughs> see, but you remember something? <laughs> Hollywood, sure. Hollywood shrewd. Hollywood shrewd. They didn't write that line arbitrarily. Oh but it's the way love is defined. Because you know what? People are fearful of how you objectively define love as the way Aquinas put it, which is, it's an objective standard. How does one love? And like Joe said, feelings really don't have anything to do with it. It could be accompanied by a feeling, okay? And it does feel, let's say, on a certain level, good to love, but ultimately the value in loving someone else is a is is selfless. It's the selflessness. It's, I just want this for you. What's words, best for you? What's best for you? That's Not why. Me. That's why a marriage, that's rooted in love, which is Christ, okay? It's synonymous, love, truth, and Christ. It's all synonymous, okay? Um, that's why marriage rooted in love lasts and, and very, uh, you know, uh, very infrequently, as we pointed out in our statistics, very infrequently end in divorce because it's a relationship of successful marriage rooted in Christ, okay? Truly rooted in Christ will survive. OK, because I tell you straight up, my wife is listening right now. OK, marriage ain't easy. My wife's a pain in the butt. OK, and I, I say that right to her face. But you want to know something? Our marriage is strong because our marriage is a giving marriage. Same way with Joe's. It's a giving relationship. OK, it's a giving one. Marriage fundamental. Isn't, marriage fundamental. isn't like sadly, again, going back to when I've taught pre k classes to people. Most people look at what am I getting out of this marriage wrong? What are you going to put into it? What are you going to give? You see, that's the successful model of marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it is. Right. And that's why it's failing. Selfishness, again, my home is not here. My home is in heaven. So therefore, I could sacrifice here. What did Francis say? It is in giving that we receive. It is in giving that we receive. That's why I have a daughter, and I'm going to tell you this right now. When she gets older, and if she told me as the society goes right now, I have a boyfriend, and we're going to live with each other. And what I'm going to tell her straight out, he does not love you because he's not committing himself to you. Any fool could pull his pants down. Any fool could pull his pants down. Commitment shows love that's why contraception is a sin right. because what contraception says i love you to a point you're going into the murky waters now joe joe but go I ahead i love you to a point and ultimately i'm using you for pleasure now nobody and wants to hear that you're using me for pleasure that's right nobody wants to hear now, that does that mean you have 13 children no but there's such a thing as natural family planning and the Crete method and if you monitor the woman's cycle you come together during periods when she's not fertile you will not have children but that does require self-discipline and not having sex when those periods, when she is fertile and having coming together when she is not. And you monitor it together. You see, that's why the contraceptive society breeds selfishness. And when you live that way, whether you realize it or not, it bleeds into other avenues of your marriage. How about every, how about every aspect? Because ultimately, life? love, I will say it again, gives. Love doesn't have boundaries. If you love somebody, I love you and I will give. 
I don't take from you, meaning for pleasure. Right. I can remember somebody I went to college with, we were having this conversation, a girl I was at, it was at a, like a reunion, very intelligent girl, very successful, married to somebody from my college. We were having a conversation and we we're talking about contraception. And I'm not gonna you know, divulge your name, but I'll, I'll just say it's Jane. I'm like, Jane, contraceptive mentality in a relationship, you're using one another. This is exactly what she says to me. I know that, I'm fine with it. How sad, how sad. Is that love? Is that love? You're using me and I'm using you. That's not what love is. I don't want that for my daughter. For a very long time has promoted all these things. All right, that's one of the reasons why we, you, could, you, could, you could scream it when we have to. That's why we're here at the front line with Joe and Joe on Sunday nights, 8 o'clock, Facebook Live. Okay, that's why we keep saying we have to speak the truth. Forget about left and right. We're looking up. Okay, because we have to speak the truth, all right? That's one of the reasons why, uh, I mean, con the contraceptive mentality, you just hit the nail on the head. The contraceptive mentality is so appropriate for, for you to bring up as, as being, I, I, I've heard a number of people say, it is the root cause of all our problems in this country. That if you want to point to abortion, if you want to point to uh, gender, this whole, this whole wave, this violent wave of gender ideology, and it is violent, okay? Um, when you talk about the whole rainbow, uh, the whole rainbow movement in this country, it all has as its source contraception, and people don't hear that. They don't hear it the way you're saying it often. I, I would say I haven't. Um, what they hear is the big bad Catholic Church wants to stop you from having sex. That's what they hear in their mind. Or they want women to just be barefoot, and barefoot and pregnant, Wrong. which is which is the opposite of the truth. Wrong. But what if? But what if? What Pope? What Pope Paul the Sixth wrote in Humanae Vitae was that it's the mentality. Now I'm paraphrasing. Okay, it is the contraceptive mentality that leads to all these problems. Joe just Joe just hit the nail right on the head because underlying it all in a mo in one of the, in, the, in the most fundamental relationship outside of your individual relationship with God the most fundamental relationship you have is with your spouse okay that at the end of the day that foundation is based on taking rather than giving I, that is the contraception mentality and i invite mentality. you to read humani vitae which came out in, in 1968 it was 68 okay read it in it the pope pope paul the 6 said that it is a sin to contracept. So it is still a sin, just so you know. If you are contracepting, you should not receive the Eucharist because you are not a practicing Catholic. That includes if you sterilized yourself. That's what the church teaches. I'm not here to point fingers. I'm telling you what the church teaches. And what he said in this is prophetic. He said that those who contracept, it will pit man against woman, it will lead to abortion, and it will lead to men not respecting women because they will treat them as things as opposed to equals. Mm -hmm. And all of that has occurred. Yep. Yep. All, let me say it again. It all has occurred. What is the, real quick though, what is the feminist response to that? Because you would think that, that the feminists would say, well, women shouldn't be treated like objects. But what did they do? I forgot who wrote the book. Um, it came out in the last few years called The Hookup Culture. Basically telling women, go out and do the same thing. Use them the way they use you. In other words, just go out and meet a man. If you want to have sex, take them home. All right. Have sex all night. And the next day, do what he's going to do to you anyway. Say, there's a door. See you. Bye. No, nah, I'm not going to give you my phone number. Encouraging women to do that. So it's so, on the one hand, it's wrong. Obviously, a man, men shouldn't look at women as objects, okay? And on the other hand, this is like a feminist who's embracing it, not only embracing it, saying, so what? Women, you should just go out and do the same thing. Talk about, talk about just, just taking one step further in, 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 towards destruction in this country. Particularly when it comes, like, like I said, to the destruction of the family. But I did want to say uh, one thing, though, but like you mentioned earlier about bad fruit. What does all this give a person's life? What is all of this? Does anyone, does anyone who, who looks at their life, who, let's say, deliberately chooses all of this? I'm not talking about people who are, who are divorced and, and are sorry. In other words, truly, I think, again, nobody's pointing fingers. 
No, nobody, nobody's saying, oh, you know, no, we're judging you. Okay, not, not my all. sins. Joe has his. Everybody has theirs. Okay, we're just pointing out the truth of the matter. Okay, don't a lot of people look at their lives and say, you know, there was a story. It, you know, I know this is extreme, but but it hit me. It was a it was a guy. I I, I should know his name, um, but uh, he was in the music industry. I think he was a producer, very successful producer. Spent his whole life, you know, uh, getting women, bringing them out on the boat, yacht, whatever, partying, sex, the whole nine yards. One day, he just wakes up, blows his brains out. That's the meaning of his life. He lived the life that we're describing Look right now. Epstein. The completely well, Epstein too. Perfect, perfect. So forget about, well, that guy was important because he just woke up one day and blew his brains out. Epstein, I dare say, if he didn't get caught, he, you know, obviously he would have probably just continued to do well, the way he was. Well, I think that probably divulged into young girls because nothing satisfied him anymore. Right, think about that. You it's have everything you want. Or I think I had this conversation with somebody at work. You have everything you want. I, you know, I work in a, I don't want to say where I work, but, but I'll put it like this. I see a lot of rich people. Okay, I see a lot of rich people on my job. And I say to one of my friends at work, what is it with a guy like Jeffrey Epstein? I said, we see guys like that all the time on our job. Jeffrey Epstein could have come in our place any night of the week, buy a bottle of Cristal, okay, get a bottle of Screaming Eagle, put it on the bar. He's going to have 10 women on him like vultures. I'm sorry, all you feminists. They're like vultures, okay? These women in particular. Swoop right, right, right around them, drink. He'll take them back to his place, and he'll have sex all night. Why did he have to go out and have sex with underage girls? Because it's not enough. That's because not things ultimately do not please you. Mm -hmm. You see, God bakes that into our, he, while he gives us free will, nothing material completely satisfies. We've talked about this on other shows. And what Joe basically was alluding to is this. You have to come to the end of yourself. You see, people who chase after things, whatever that thing is, whether it's power, job, sex, dope, whatever, at the end of the day, you come up empty. And if you're honest with yourself, you will look at yourself and say, there has to be something more. Mm. And that, when you ask that question, that's, they say, when you've hit the bottom, that's when God says, now let us begin. You see, sadly, that's sometimes what it has to take. This does not satisfy. If you don't believe me, keep doing what you're doing. Right. That's all I'm going to say. Then, but, then if you, but then if you keep doing what you're doing, and we say it all the time, and you look at yourself in the mirror and say, my life's a mess, do us all a favor and don't blame us. Don't blame us. I said before, I'll say it again, I lived that life. It is empty. It is a dead end. It goes nowhere. A friend of mine, thank God, and I mean this sincerely, thank God he preserved me from drugs, okay? I've had enough vices in my life. But that was one that it was God and my earthly father, Junior, who said, I'll kill you if you ever do drugs. So I, I took that one to heart. OK, he didn't kill me when I started smoking cigarettes and all that. But he said, I'll kill you if, if you do drugs. Thank God. But the one thing I've heard, a recurring theme from all my friends who've ever told me about drugs. OK, so I'm just going to take their word for it. And it speaks exactly to what you're saying, exactly what we're saying about Jeffrey Epstein. Let's take cocaine. They said you do cocaine. And there is nothing like the experience of when you first do cocaine. A friend of mine, because in another life, I used to think I wanted to be an actor. Still am a pretty good actor. Uh, he said, imagine winning an Academy Award in a Martin Scorsese movie for best actor. And then multiply that experience by 100. All right. That's the first experience of doing coke, which, let, which convinced me never, ever, ever to do cocaine. And he said, every time you do it after that. You will never get back to that first time. It's the same thing. That's why people fall deeper and deeper. I'm just using, like, say, drugs as an example. When you fall deeper and deeper and deeper into any sin, it's always the same problem. You want that feeling that you had the first time, and you keep chasing it. The problem is you'll never get there. It'll never satisfy you because, again, it's not of God, all right? Um, and you're just going to keep falling deeper and deeper and deeper until, like you said, until you get to that point where God says, okay. In other words, and you, you have the grace to reach up to him, all right, who's constantly reaching down to you to pull you out, um, to reach up to him and say, help me. Another problem here, humility. If we were talking about sacrifice, people, they don't want to ask God for help. I mean, you could speak to that, but they don't want to ask God for They feel like it's almost, I don't need God's help. The first thing an alcoholic does, if you ever go to AA, the first thing you have to do is admit 
This is a known, no, this is a successful program, by the way. The first thing that you have to do if you go to AA is say, I am an alcoholic. Those words have to come out of your mouth. The second thing you do is you have to say, I cannot uh, basically get over this problem without the help of a higher power. That's how they phrase it. So what they're basically saying is, I, my life is out of control and I need help that's above and beyond me. See, that's why God came into the world. You see, people look at the church in, the, in an incorrect light. You see, the church, and Francis says this, and he's spot on, the church is not a museum for saints. It is a hospital for sinners. I am a Catholic because of the sacraments. I go to receive the sacraments. The sacraments come from God himself, and there is only one human being that rose from the dead, and I believe that. So there, and he founded one church. That's why I go to that church. And I need the sacraments because I am a sinner. You see, and it is because of that that Christ came to help us overcome the greatest enemy, which is us. Mm -hmm. You see, that's why I'm Catholic. Well, explain that real quick, though. What are the three things, we, the three enemies of our soul? It's the world, the devil, and ourselves. Well, there it Always is. seemed, again, we just had a conversation this afternoon with Jesse Romero. And we're talking all about the evil one. We know how much of a scumbag he is, okay, and what he tries to do. For, but let's not exclude ourselves. That old saying, that old, that old statement, you know, I'm, I'm my own worst enemy, it's true. We're our own worst enemies sometimes. That's why what Joe, why Joe, was, what Joe was saying is so important. Be, but nobody wants to have the humility to say to God, try it my way, Pop. Try it my way, Father. It didn't work. It didn't work, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm too deep now. I need your help. But you have, to have, you have to have humility to do that. And again, I speak from my own personal experience, okay? When you're a 37-year-old man living on your mother's couch, okay, Thank God, thank God God didn't let me fall further, okay? But the thing is, that'll wake you up. And you'll, you'll wake up and you'll say, and look in the mirror, and you say, I need help. And understand, by the way, and this is, was a grace for me that God gave me to recognize that I needed to call out to him. That's why we started out talking about God, family, and country as it pertains to the United States of America in 2019. We need to do that individually. I think you would, be, oh. you, you would agree. We need to do that as a nation. We need to repent as a nation, okay? Uh, it, it's because, because the, the things that we, we allow to happen in this country, okay? Um, and we, we, we talk more in depth about the breakdown of the family and everything else. Maureen uh, came by. Maureen, what's happening? Um, and she said the redefinition of love, the contraceptive mentality leads to the redefinition of love, being objectified, um, issues that have led to sorrow. And trauma, these are Maureen's words, trauma doesn't prepare men and women for marriage and for strengthening family. This is by design, Maureen. That's one of the reasons we're here at the front line with Joe and Joe. And actually, it's that, all by design. That leads to an interesting question. Again, talking about pre cana teaching people like, you know, what marriage is, objectively speaking. Do you think, I always get a kick out of, um, I got married later in life. I was 43. I've only been married six years. But, um. Do you think all of a sudden I, you, people like they have a bachelor party and they go out like living like crazy people? Do you think you all of a sudden just flip the switch to a virtuous life and have a successful marriage? I wish. <laughs> by just saying I do? Yeah. No. There has to be discipline, self-discipline. Virtue has to be baked into your life. You see, this is again the delusion of this American nightmare that has been sold to people right to have a successful marriage requires those things and you don't just flick the switch and obtain them again living a virtuous life following a guiding principle right a godly guiding principle helps you to do that which helps society to function properly. But here we're going to talk about solutions because I think it's important. And jo Joe just alluded to the interview we just did with Jesse Romero, which will be posted shortly on a number of different platforms. 
what are the solutions? And I'm taking this from him and I'm going to give him, you know, kudos. I told him I steal it. So I'm going to continue to steal it from him. He talks about the five stones of David. and He's alluding to David and Goliath. David was a boy and he slew a giant with a stone. Well, here's our stones. And I always do this. I say this every New Year's. I sometimes post it on Facebook. Everyone has their New Year's resolution. Mm. I'm going to give you five things that you can do. I'm the life coach and I'm not going to charge you a dime. I'm going to tell you if you do these five things and you do them consistently for a calendar year, your life will improve. If your life will improve. Let's begin. One, go to church every Sunday if you're a practicing Catholic. That takes 40 minutes a week. Two, pray the rosary every day. That takes 15 minutes a day. He said, er day. A day. Er day. 15 minutes. <laughs> Three, read the scripture every day. What you could do is read the readings from the daily mass. That's one Old Testament reading, one gospel, one psalm. That takes two minutes. You go on, go on your cell phone, uh, iPhone or, or Samsung, and download Laudate, L-A-U-D-A-T-E. All right, and on there is a, a very good, I would say, uh, resource for a lot of things, a lot of prayers, saints of the day and all that. But in there is uh, the daily readings. So we're, we're up to four minutes a week, 40 minutes a week to go to church, 15 minutes a day to say the rosary, two minutes a day to read the scripture. Four, go to confession once a month. That takes five minutes a month. And that requires a virtue known as humility. And what does confession do? You're forgiven of your sins. And God gives you the grace to overcome other sins. And five, fast every Friday. Nothing crazy, something small that's a little pinch. Mm -hmm. Don't put cough, don't put milk in your coffee. And um, offer it up. Don't eat meat. If you do those five things, you will see a difference in your life. I put that on Facebook, New Year's. Everyone has all these New Year's resolutions. I'm gonna go to the gym, I'm gonna lose 40 pounds, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm giving you something right here that costs nothing and doesn't even take a lot of time and I will guarantee that it will change your life yet people don't do it. It actually boggles my mind. It boggles my mind. People rather will wallow in their own misery and sorrow. Up until a point when, you know, when people feel the need. Somebody told me, I, I, I watched a guy who was in a QA. and I forgot who it was, it was with a, a priest um, who was given a, did a talk and was given a QA. and a And the guy said, the guy said, um, Father, I want to just say very quickly, I came back to the church. He told this story about how years ago he was very rebellious and all that and wouldn't do the things that you're describing right now. Set aside a little time and a good priest, he said, said to him to do similar things to what you're saying right now, to just, you know, do these basic things. It'll begin to, you know, train yourself, develop good habits. Obviously, you're asking for God's grace in your prayers. So that's going to obviously strengthen you and help you to be successful. Um, and the dude basically brushed off the priest, and uh, he said he converted back to the Catholic Church. After years after this, he heard this priest. Um, he converted back to the Catholic Church because the priest said to him as he walked away back into, you know, the distant land like the prodigal son, the priest said, you could come, the, the church will have you back anytime you want. He, and he said that one thing that the priest said, out of all the things he tried to tell him, the way he says, you could come back anytime you want, the church will always have you. Ten years as he fell, my point in telling the story, ten years as this dude fell further and further into sin and misery, okay, he remembered what the priest said. And true, true to form, God bless the priest that who he eventually went back. He went and said, Father, I need confession. He said, okay, right over there. He gave confession. He's now a practicing Catholic. He's in the sacraments. Um, but my point is that, in bringing that up, is that unfortunately given our nature, okay, and I'm not excluding myself from this, 
Sometimes we need to fall further and so that we wake up. I do think that what's important is, yes, I am plugging the front line with Joe and Joe and many others out there like Terry and Jesse um, and people like that who are my church, people who are telling the truth. If we're out there, as Jesse described, saturating the airwaves with the truth, bombarding the airwaves with the truth. Because remember, there's a lot of obstacles in our way. You got Hollywood. You got the advertising industry. You got television. You got the music industry. You have, you have all this nonsense. Okay, If we're saturating the airwaves with the truth, we will, we will be fishers of men. We will, we will plant the seed with someone and just let them know, man, you're talking to two guys. You're not going to surprise us or shock us by, by how you're living your life because odds are we did it too at some point in our life. The point is to tell the truth, to start living in the truth. That's what Joe was describing about the five stones, okay? Living in the truth, having your daily, your daily life informed by God. You know what I started to do recently? Just, you know, I heard, I heard again, because we listen to. Uh, we don't have all the answers, nowhere near all the answers. Uh, I heard somebody say, uh, wake up in the morning and uh, just say a Hail Mary. Just wake up in the morning and say a Hail Mary. And before you go to sleep, no, I pray during the day. I have, I have prayers at times of the day. And last week I woke up, and rather than think about Fox News and the impeachment hearing and, and, and all this other stuff, I prayed a Hail Mary. And then I woke up and had my coffee or whatever and started to wake up. And then later on in the day I prayed my prison. When I went to bed that night, I prayed a Hail Mary. You want to know what? I've already developed a good habit, all right? It's great for my soul. And it reminds me to begin and end my day with God. That's, is that, is and, that hard? And I'll say this. If you think what I'm saying is garbage, if you think what I'm saying is utter nonsense, and I'm wor worshiping, as the atheists would say, the spaghetti monster in the sky, or whatever <laughs> yeah. they say. Flying straight. Thanks, Mr. Dawkins. Thanks, Professor Dawkins. What I will say is this. You're never going to find perfect people. You're not looking at two people who are perfect. Look at people. You, there's, a, there's something in Scripture, and I, I'm a firm believer in listening to Scripture, not just reading it, but listening to it. You know them by their fruit. Look at people who do what I just said. All walks of life, not just religious, because there's good religious and there's bad religious. There's good Catholics and there are bad Catholics, frankly, and you could find them. If you want to look, you could find the good, you could find the bad, just like in anything. Look at the people who do those things and look at the fruit of their life. Married 60 years, have still good connections with their children. They're healthy. They're not drug addicts. They don't drink excessively. They have good habits. They're not financially bankrupt. They're not in debt. Look at the fruit of their choices. They're married to good women good men, don't abuse them. Look at the fruit of their choices. You will know them by their fruit. And all of that requires work. All of that requires a foundation. Don't take my word for it. Look, and I was just fortunate enough that I received a family that did that. Frankly, they weren't perfect and they still aren't. Who is? But the point, and I'm not perfect, but the point is I lived in that structure and I know it works because I saw it work. If you think I'm full of crap, um, look at people who do that right. and look at the fruit that their life produces. Now, inversely, look at the fruit of people who don't. And then decide for yourself. And don't measure them by their bank book either. Has Just nothing to do has with nothing that. to do with money in a bank. Nothing. Because there are plenty of people who live in garden apartments, who sit in the back row of a church, who drive a really old car, who are very happy. Very yeah. happy. Don't judge a person's so, happiness by the size of their bank book. So that's what I'm saying. And there it is. So I'm just telling you the God's honest truth, and I'm saying this to help you. I am no better than you. I am you, actually. I want to follow up on what you're saying. This is so important. This is so important to what we do here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Because some, some of you may say, well, why are, you, why are you guys getting all religious on us today? We want to hear about the Democrats and politics and everything else. Because ultimately, ultimately, now all those things are very important to talk about and the attacks on our freedom and all that. It's not second fiddle, okay? But none of that, 
None of that. Joe said in the beginning of the final segment here tonight, we were going to try to offer some solutions. That's why we're, that's why we're talking the way we're talking. You're not going to get societal change from the outside in. Societal change is going to come from the ground up. It starts in your own home. We've said this a million times on the front line with Joe and Joe. You want to change the world, go make your bed. Who said that? Didn't somebody say that? You want to change the world? And there's truth in that. There's big truth in that. Clean up your own house first. Live that ordered life, which is such a bad word nowadays. Ordered such a bad word. Order. We need to value order because what we have now is chaos. We need to get back to that order. That's why we said God, family, country. That is the proper order and the proper, if you want to call it, American perspective. God, family, country. Clean up your own house first. That spills over into your neighborhood. That spills over into your community. That spills over into your town, into your county, into your state, and into the nation. More importantly, it spills over into the culture. See, it's the culture that's corrupt. By doing the things that Joe was describing and I was describing, by living that ordered life, living a self-sacrificing life with discipline, putting God first, okay, that changes the culture. When the culture, when the culture changes, that's when the politics really change. Now, you can change the laws here and there, okay? You can achieve political victories here and there. But if you truly want to save this country, if you, if you are a person, as Joe and I are, that believe America is a great nation and can be infinitely greater, okay, because we do have some very atrocious sins that we're committing right now, okay, then we need to start by cleaning up our own house, by living that ordered life, by putting God first, and then letting that and start, starting to organize and starting to letting that, let that spill over into the culture, which in turn will change our politics. I will say that just, just, just to put a, a finer point on it, going back to our typical front line with Joe and Joe shows, okay, on Sunday nights, Facebook Live at 8 o'clock. Do you think if you had a society that we just described, okay, a truly authentically free society, not enslaved by pornography, by usury, not enslaved by consumerism nor socialism, just a, an ordered life with big families and solid marriages, okay, do you think any of those Democrats that are on that Democrat debate stage the other night would even dare say the things that they're saying? They say those things, and they take those positions that are completely antithetical to anything that we're describing because they know they can. Because we have a culture right now that is a... Donald Trump called Washington a swamp. Culturally speaking, America is a swamp. America culturally is a swamp, okay? It is what T.S. Eliot called the wasteland. That's what it is. And if we want to start planting some good trees, all right, and have them grow in the midst of that wasteland and eventually overtake the wasteland, we need to start with ourselves and we need to start getting the truth out there, primarily by the way we live our lives. But I, my larger point was that those Democrats wouldn't stand a chance. And I'm not picking on them because they're, because they're Democrats. I'm picking on them because their ideas are stupid and dangerous. But they wouldn't be able to say that stuff. If people lived in America the way you were just describing, about family and everything else, those none of those people would hold the positions they do. None of them. They would they oh, couldn't would, they couldn't say oh, would, they you, Joe, they could not say with a straight face I, the, the things they, they they that they believe in. Okay. The reason they say it is because they really feel like there's enough people in this country that will fall fall for that that trash. Well, there is. And, Unfortunately. And, and ultimately, like I said, you could think of everything we said and throw it in the garbage. What all I'm going to say, and I'll leave you with this thought, is this. You will know them by the fruit they bear. Look closely at people who do what we do, what we say and do, and look at their life, the peaceful life that they live, the productive life that they live. They're not perfect people. And then look at those who don't. Look at the governments, meaning the smaller governments, the cities run by the people that Joe, look at the state that they're in, and then decide. Ultimately, life is a choice. We all make choices. We make choices every day. We make choices to be happy. Life, joy, happiness is a choice. And it begins by looking to something which is larger than us. Because something is larger than us, 
And here's the good news. It loves us. God takes nothing and only adds to your life. You could believe it or not. I feel like Ripley's believe it or not. I feel like what's his name? Jack, whatever. I, I, I forgot his name, but yeah. Believe it or, or not. not. Well, we <laughs> choose to believe in God. We know that a lot of people that are watching the front line with Joe and Joe on Sunday nights at 8 o'clock and sharing our videos, please. Encourage your friends to share our videos and follow us on Facebook. Um, we know that when we're talking to you, we, we know that we're not we're not talking to people who, who don't feel the same way. We need to join together, okay? And we need to spread that that joy of the truth, even though we both get aggravated and our brains pop out of our heads. But we, we enjoy and experience the joy in telling the truth. And we're trying to encourage others who are watching us. Joe joined us. Louie, uh, Lou, good friend of ours, just joined us. Maureen and everybody out there. Go. We have to stand up. Stand up, even on personal levels. It doesn't have to be on a megaphone. It doesn't have to be on Facebook Live. Just let people know, no, I don't agree with this culture. No, I don't agree with the road that America is going down. No, no, no. And give good reasons why. And the best reason why is because we believe in God. And also, like I said, our normal show, which we usually do, we basically give a roundup of a lot of uh, current events that the mainstream media mm -hmm. does not cover. That's basically what we do, and that's what we're going to continue to do. We're just going to do that this week on Tuesday between 10 and 11. It will be a live broadcast on the Crusade channel. It is free. You could listen to it. There are call-ins. The number will be available to you. you you're free to call in. Um, I think it'll be a fantastic show. Mike Church runs a great operation. You could also subscribe to certain aspects of his channel. I highly recommend that as well. He's a great man. He does great work. And um, we're just happy to be a part of it. So Tuesday of this week, we will be live on the Crusade channel. You could listen to us on the internet. With that said, thank you very much. And we'll end as we always do, Joseph. Yeah, I do. Well, let's just give one more quick reminder. Uh, we did we did a kick butt interview this afternoon with another guy who's storming the machine gun nest ahead of the front line. So he's actually he's actually dodging bullets. Um, Jesse Romero, great conversation that we had with him. Uh, it's a little over an hour, about an hour and ten minutes. That's going to be posted um, on our on our Facebook page on the front line with Joe and Joe. Keep your eyes open for that. We think you're really going to enjoy it. Typical Joe and Joe style, talking with another guy who speaks our language and speaks it the same way we do. All right. Uh, only he's on the West Coast and we're over here in, in, in New Jersey. Uh, so keep your eye open for that. And we want to thank you all for joining us, as you always do, and supporting the front line with Joe and Joe. Facebook Live, Sunday nights, 8 o'clock. And remember, our conversation is your conversation. And that conversation, that's going on everywhere. So we'll see you Tuesday on the Crusade Channel between 10 and 1. Be well and happy Thanksgiving. Happy week. Thanksgiving.